Uh, here we are, day two, uh, Fully Charged Live Vancouver, Winter Electric Vehicle Association. We have Jose Fong, BC Ambulance. He's got himself here, a very nice uh, Maki uh, supervisor dispatcher. Uh, no, it's a uh, primary response unit, but also a supervisor vehicle. Right. What can you tell us about it? Uh, it is a California Route 1 with a real world range of 415 kilometers. And uh, we use it uh, for uh, advanced care of paramedics responding to high acuity calls. And you've had it in service now for how long? Uh, a few months because we had to outfit it. And so some of the things that we've done is we're able to use the uh, board screen to have a dispatch uh, information displayed on it and then the navigation to the call. Uh, we also have um, uh, all the lights, radios off of an auxiliary battery system so that it doesn't impact at all the Ford battery system. So it's completely independent, but it'll charge at the same time. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. That's uh, similar to the uh, police law of Hawaii. It's an as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the details of your update. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's really cool. Um, so the, the program is financed through the Carbon Neutral Capital Program, and uh, so uh, each year with the Carbon Neutral Capital Program, we're able to transition our SUV fleet to electric vehicles. And at some point in the future, you'd, you'd like to move towards uh, fully electric, uh, large ambulances. Yes, um, to meet the target of. Clean BC, which is 40% reduction by 2030. Um, that's our goal. And since 95% of our carbon emissions are from our fleet, um, that's a big target for us. Day two of uh, Fully Charged Live Vancouver, Metro Electric Vehicle Association. I'm here with Ken Hendricks at EV Friendly. Ken, what is EV Friendly all about? Okay, the EV Friendly is a program uh, that is powered by the Automotive Retailers Association of BC. We represent the aftermarket industry, basically anything that happens to the life of the vehicle after it's sold new. We started EV Friendly because we felt the need we needed to educate industry about EVs, but also consumers. So we want to take things from the used experience as opposed to the new. Right on. And uh, you were involved with a lot of uh, webinars and bringing people from all yeah. across the industry in and trying yeah. to uh, educate them. I remember that was uh, a bit of an uphill struggle a lot of the time. <laughs> it is. Uh, we're gaining great traction. So we have our uh, we have our social media channels. Uh, check us out on YouTube. Just Google EV Friendly. We'll come up. Uh, we host educational podcasts uh, and videos, uh, at both for industry but also for the consumer. Uh, we're feeling now that as the vehicle fleet is aging, a lot of people now have a lot of questions about how can I maintain my EV. On the run and Scott Chiraburo. He's the guy who's a communicator uh, for Parkland and their their whole process here with the church. Welcome to work. This, this is great. Uh, uh, love what you're doing here with the, uh, the whole site here. Uh, tell us a bit about what the On the Run is doing. So we're doing what we can to get EV charging infrastructure uh, in place across British Columbia. So we, last year we had one site in place. Um, as of right now we have 33 fast charging sites in place uh, across the province and then by the end of the year We've got construction crews going all over the province right now. We're going to be at 50 sites. By the end of the year. We did recently, though, open a site in Hope, um, which is uh, the largest scale site that we've built so far. Um, that site is uh, the, it's the largest open access charging site anywhere in Canada. It can charge 12 vehicles simultaneously. It can go up to 200 kilowatts of charging. If you're headed out into the interior, uh, going out to the cottage, it's a fantastic place to charge, to grab a burger, to grab some snacks for the road. There's a liquor store there, there's a grocery store there, it's a fantastic place to be headed up uh, in, in the interior. 
And uh, what is uh, Parkland and On the Run doing uh, going forward with uh, getting into even bigger churches? Yeah, so it's the what we've seen at Hope has been tremendous customer feedback. But they love having many uh, many stalls available, no queuing available. The performance of the chargers is great there. Um, it's, it's a reliable place to be able to charge. And so what we're doing is looking for opportunities to be able to build larger and larger locations, right? Um, sometimes uh, at our sites, we don't have the space available to do that, but in places where we do, we're going to be looking to add more and more charging devices. We do think that's it's better for us. It's actually cheaper for us to build, and it's a better experience for our customers as well. I know a lot of the uh, advocates, they uh, paid attention when uh, uh, your company won the electric autonomy competition for the EV charging site of the future, and it was, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Great to see that happen. Yeah, so um, just to clarify, we, we sponsored the competition. It was an architect in the UK, James oh, right. Sylvester, that won the competition. Um, we, we got a phenomenal number of uh, submissions from all across the world. Um, they came in from the UK, they came in from Turkey, they came in from France, they came in from the US, like just, they came in from absolutely everywhere. And the creativity that was shown there was just phenomenal. People essentially redesigning, rather than trying to put charging, station, uh, charging stations at existing gas stations, which is where, how we have started, they were reimagining the entire experience. So looking at how do you build essentially a charging station or a refueling station without fuel, right? Um, which has been great to see. So yeah, the winning design, we've met James Sylvester. Um, we're, uh, we're committed to build that and we are, we've been looking for sites um, across BC um, to try to find the right location. It has to be in the right location because we want to make sure that's going to, we're going to see the demand um, we can have the amenities that we're looking for to make sure it's going to be a positive experience for consumers. Um, but yeah, really exciting to think through what does that look like um, as we start to build newer locations. It's, just, it's more degrees of freedom for us to do very, very interesting things. Um, and hopefully that'll resonate with consumers. Right on. Uh, any question you wish to ask me? Uh, I, I don't think so. I, I think uh, really we, uh, we've really appreciated the feedback we received about our site. I mean, EV drivers have been a phenomenal community, um, and for us to be part of that community has been really fantastic. So definitely encourage people to get out, try our sites, definitely encourage people to, to keep providing us feedback. We're working hard to make sure that we're getting better and better every single time. We're committed to make this happen for the EV drivers. Yeah, terrific. Thanks, Scott. Great. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Appreciate it. He's going to talk to us about two of the models that they have uh, here explained to today. Yeah, well, thanks. It's a pleasure. We're super excited to be here for the Charge Live in Vancouver. So here on the show floor today, we have our Volvo VNRE electric truck. We have the chassis here and our Mac uh, fully electric refuse truck. And both of these are uh, North American products brought to us here by AB Volvo out of Sweden. Uh, global technology company has got a lot of experience in the EV space and zero emission space. And both of these trucks are designed to completely replace the diesel fuel alternative that people might be using at present. Uh, and for example, our, uh, in fact, this refuse truck here uh, is in service uh, with uh, University of Donald Lands and it, it goes out every week and collects refuse and recyclables and trash. And it's super viable, works a full day, recharges the whole day. And it's really fun. So, uh, we're hoping that uh, other municipalities and, and commercial vehicle customers recognize there's an opportunity today for them to take that first step and to make that first move into decarbonization and to look at choices other than the standard diesel purchases that they might otherwise make. Not only is there a climate change message to be thought about as people are thinking about purchasing alternative technologies, but there's also a business case that can be made, a legitimate business case that can be made right now for people to switch to electric, to switch to battery electric. And in the case of a battery electric refuse truck, um, this is a truck that typically has about a 120 month lifespan of the asset 
And our studies are telling us now that at about 36 months into the life of a 120-month vehicle, a customer gets to cost parity at over diesel. And so for the rest of the life of the truck, past 36 months, they're money ahead, if you will. Uh, it's a more profitable venture of the operating battery electric. So not only is there a good news story on the environment, there's a great news story from a business case perspective on switching to battery electric. And that's the message we hope people will take away uh, today from the charge for And there's even potential for vehicles to stay on the road longer. Absolutely. So electric motor, there's no rebuild. You're, you're, you're right on. And, and actually, maintenance is a key part of our conversation we have with customers. Um, and on both of these trucks behind me, um, after acquisition, the customer really has nothing to worry about other than putting electrons and electricity into the vehicle. Um, included with these vehicles uh, is a contract where we maintain all of the maintenance on the vehicle for five or for six years of the customer's choice. Um, and so they really have the responsibility of putting a driver in the truck, changing the tires so the tires are worn out, and charging at the end of the day, and that's the customer's responsibility. So we've taken away a lot of the variables and the maintenance costs that would otherwise be easily possible. When it comes to the various government incentives, do you yeah. go forward to help the customer get that? Yeah, so one of the things we've, you know, in the old days with, with the diesel purchase, it was kind of a simple thing. People said, well, how much is it? There was a price and a way to win. And today it's not quite that simple. There's a number of layers to this that need to be properly understood, and there's some great programs. The programs that come from BC Hydro, uh, provincial government of BC has offered some great incentives, the federal government has some great incentives. So our recommendation is for people to fully understand and, and research what those options are, and we can consult and help with them on that. Uh, and then there's also some, some amazing uh, companies that are uh, here at the show, actually, um, that will offer our customers pathways towards, towards acquiring some of those brands and some of those incentives. But yeah, if we're an approved dealer for Transport Canada, uh, we can, at the time of purchase, deduct off uh, the federal incentive all right off the purchase price. Uh, and we can help guide customers towards acquiring the provincial money as well. So yeah, there's there's a lot there's a lot of programs, and I think the reality is in this space, those programs are not going to last forever. So we're encouraging people that think that they could be on that path to early adoption uh, to make a move now to get take advantage of all the incentives that are available today and to not be left behind. Right on. Any question you wish I'd asked you, Ken? No, I just uh, we just need to get going in this whole space. That's yeah, yeah. what we need to do. So, yeah. Thanks, Ken. I think we got to. Uh, Welcome our first guest for our digital fireside chat. Um, I know many of you will know uh, Sandy Munro. He is the chief executive of Munro and Associates. He's an amazing automotive engineer, and he's widely known for all his, uh, his work in his industry, for his lean design methodology. And now, of course, um, Munro Live, uh, the YouTube channel, which is amazing. So please welcome onto the stage, Sandy Munro. the Inflation Reduction Act is and what impact it's having in America. The more I read about the colossal battery factories that are being built, the, the innovation, the research, you know, there's a lot, it seems to have had an effect. Am I, am I right in assuming that or is that not quite right? <laughs> well, it's had an effect, all right. Um, it, it's amazing to me um, how sometimes you, you wind up, what, what is that thing called, the, um, uh, the, uh, law of unintended consequences or whatever. Yeah. Anyhow, um, we're seeing a lot of people <clears throat> trying their best to uh, to get into batteries. They're trying to catch up 15 years in uh, in one year. <clears throat> and it's uh, it's amazing to watch. The, uh, the government is doing the best they can, but uh, one of the things that I think is really amazing is the uh, in the 1980s, I guess, the U.S. made this agreement with uh, Switzerland, or sorry, uh, Sweden, and that was to try and get them into NATO. Well, it never really happened, but they signed an agreement that said, hey, if it's made in Sweden, you can bring it into the United States free, you know, right. taxes and tariffs. And and so now they've got to think, well, we don't want any Chinese cars in the country. Well, yeah. guess what? Volvo's Chinese. And yeah. on and on and on. Yeah. So it's going to be a real uh, problem for a lot of the people in the administrations to try and figure out how we're gonna undo this law because being, 
BYD is already in the U.S. They're the biggest electric bus company in yeah. the United States. It's going to be very difficult for them to say, oh, no, no, you can't do that anymore. It's, like I say, um, poorly planned. Manufacturing in Europe, instead of in the U.K., definitely we've suffered that. In Europe and in North, in North America, we just ship it all to China. Yeah, they, they, they make it. Yeah, no, that's, been, yeah. that's not a new thing that happened in the last two years. That's happened, you know, no, 40 I, I, plus years ago. So uh, we wound up in situations uh, at Monroe and Associates where people are saying, well, you don't want to hire somebody local. You want to go to India or you want to go to China or you yeah. want to go to wherever. And uh, so we watched our productivity and uh, our, our sales drop. Um, and that was all coming from Harvard. You know, get it cheap. Uh, right. cheap. Well, I have a book called Cheap Always Loses. And, uh, and, it, and it falls right into line where you've got hey, we're going to make four or five different quarters and, uh, and it's going to be a good price and blah, blah. And then all of a sudden you find out, oh, all our technology is gone? Yeah. I mean, the Chinese cars, <laughs> Chinese cars are really well done. Yeah. Uh, I know because I couldn't find any work in the U.S. So I was in China from 2014 to 2019 helping them design, guess what, electric cars. Yeah. And they already knew how to put cars together because... BMW, Volkswagen, GM, everybody who was anybody had them build their cars. Yeah. And they brought over all the techniques and technologies you need to make a very, very good car. Yeah. And then we came over and said, okay, you're building cars for somebody else. Now it's time for you to build your own cars. Here's how you design them. And so little tricks like uh, uh, one gram every day, every engineer. You know what? Uh, when you get down to grams, of reduction, and that's one of the big five for uh, for electric, uh, like range, if you like. Yeah. When you get down that small, these guys start really thinking deeply, wow. and that's why not only do they know how to build them because they learn from the absolute best, they also know how to design them. And on top of that, they've been into batteries for what twenty years. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, is that they actually work on how can I? There'll be an engineer somewhere in China who works on how can I reduce the weight of this MG4 by one gram? Is that a, is that a real? And that's exactly right. Wow. So you start off and you can take you can take kilograms yeah. out. Okay, now you're into the short strokes. If I can use is that politically correct? I think. I, 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 okay, I think so I won't use that term. I'll use something else. <laughs> okay, so anyways, you're you're down to just the finished product. And now finding a gram is a big deal. And what you start doing is, well, we're going to drill out the head of, uh, or not drill it out, but you stamp it out. So the head of a, uh, of a hex head bolt, okay, you whack the center, and that gives you a couple of grams. Wow. Multiply that times, you know, a thousand bolts inside the car, yeah. and all of a sudden you're, you're back up to kilograms right. again. So wow. it causes people to think when you change the rules. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's because it is confusing. I mean, we've certainly, we're now in the UK, we have a really large array of Chinese vehicles that are on the market that are coming in Europe even more so. I mean, Norway is extraordinary. The, the cars that you can get there, which you can't get in China, which is one of the reasons we've really, we're so keen to get Elliot who reviews cars for us in China. So he's seeing all those cars. But, and I think even, I always remember going to the Geneva Motor Show in 2009, I think it was, and there were a load of BYD vehicles that were built as taxis. And I, I have 1% of the knowledge and skill of how you build a car that you do. But even I could see these are a little bit wobbly and a little bit, you know, yeah. the door didn't look like it was quite that. You see them now, they are as good as a BMW or, a, 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 you know, any European car. But they are a BMW. I mean, everybody, yeah. everybody's stolen all that stuff. Uh, it's, there's no, no way you can protect the patent on, a, on virtual balls or something like that for the steering system. It's too late. Yeah. And now they know how to build them because they built them there. And not only that, they built all the parts for the BMW that was being sold in Germany, being yeah. built and sold in Germany. So this uh, idea of, uh, you know, oh, we'll just send it offshore. And well, that was not a very, I didn't think it was a good one in the past. And I certainly am happy to smile at those people who say, well, we should get back. And they were the same guys that said, let's send it off. Let's sure. send it off. Yeah. yeah so, and then we need to bring it back. But yeah. I mean, do you think, is there a, a, a chance, do you think, that really large scale manufacturing will return to the, the North American continent? I mean, is that, is that, you know, that's presumably the intent of the internal. Well, I, what, I'm, what I'm telling you is that, uh, or what I think is that, yeah, they're they're building battery plants. They're swapping from ice to uh, to electric motors and stuff like that. 
But really and truly, when you think about it, uh, I can, um, it takes me about a thousand people and about 300,000, 400,000 square feet to build uh, a, a, an engine. Right. I can build an electric motor in a broom closet. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it doesn't require a lot of people. It uh, requires very few machines and, um, and very, very little can go wrong. Uh, if you want to look at a transmission, an automatic transmission has thousands of parts in it. And, um, and now I can go to a gearbox like a, in a, an electric car and I've got, I got basically four gears and two, two, a lay shaft and a, and a, and a, and a drive shaft and everything else is gone. Yeah. I mean, so the amount of labor that I need is vastly different now than what I had in the past. So there, I think that there will be, uh, somebody was asking yesterday, uh, who's going to disappear? Who's going to be in the electronics yeah. graveyard? I don't think you're going to see too many people go completely out of business, but there'll be a, a whole lot smaller. Right. Yeah, right. A lot smaller. And you're talking like of, of, of U.S. brands or North uh, American US, brands? Yeah. Well, no, I'm talking about um, European and North American uh, and Chinese. And, or, sorry, not. So I'm looking at Japanese, Korean, uh, North right. American, and European. So I believe that the biggest brand is going to be BYD in the very, very new future. Yeah. Uh, they own the market in China now, uh, and I believe that you're going to see shrinkage, huge amount of shrinkage in uh, Volkswagen, uh, GM, uh, a lot, almost everybody. Yeah. Toyota is going to take a hit. Yeah. They all are. And yeah. the reason for that is because the Chinese were taught well. Here we are, day two, uh, fully charged live Vancouver, Ventura Electric Vehicle Association, and here we have one of our members, Terry Orr, with his electric conversion of a what year? Uh, 284 Ford Ranger. Ford, Ford Ranger. So, yeah. So this is it. Uh, yeah, so I'm a recent transplant. I was uh, living in Calgary last uh, seven, eight years and started working on uh, doing EV conversions. And this is the first one I ever did seven years ago. Uh, I really wanted a truck. And of course, uh, nobody really made one, uh, so I had to make my own. So I beat Ford, GM, Tesla, uh, to make my own electric truck. Um, yeah, I guess uh, what I like to do is uh, build a really cool custom vehicle that's also electric. Then I'll go to the car shows, and uh, that's kind of my way of getting all the gearheads and everybody to get interested and start thinking about electric vehicles. And you know, the fact that they can be old school and still cool. And a whole lot more fun, a lot more torque. Yeah, you know, like this car, uh, basically this truck runs just perfectly. No maintenance, no oil changes, uh, no uh, tune up. Uh, once it's done, and it as much as well, that's it, it's done. All the other things, like brakes or whatever, general things, yeah, you still have to up, it's an old truck. It still makes noise, it's still got a few creaks and groans and stuff like that. But um, I've been kind of working on it for the last uh, number of years and just every day uh, I'll, I'll do small improvements and that sort of thing, tweak it, that sort of thing. So are you looking for an angel investor to make this a business? You know what, yeah, I wouldn't mind actually having a giant warehouse garage and doing 20 cars at a time, all different kinds of uh, uh, sports cars, uh, muscle cars, I mean, that would be a good thing. Yeah, but we need to find the right angel investor. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, cool. Sir. Sure. Do you want to ask about range and torque and all those truck no, things? It doesn't matter. It's a cool truck. <laughs> doesn't matter. That's right. Forget about the range. Who cares about the range? The range is good enough. Right? I don't think you're going to Newfoundland. Does it matter? I got to here. That's all that matters. Oh, I wanted to tell you guys my funny story. So, okay. when I was talking to Jason... I said, look, you know what, uh, I'm driving this truck, it'll, it'll make it there, I'm not worried about that. But then it's going to sit there for three days, and then I have to drive home and catch a ferry. Well, I need two or three hours of charging to pop it back up. So I'm assuming it's called free charge. When I get there, I'll be able to charge it up at the show. And he's like, mm, uh, I don't know about that. So he had to look into it, and he goes, oh yeah, well, BC Hydro, they're going to have a charge. And so 
I said, okay, great. So I get here, and sure enough, they're all level three. So I can't do level two. So I need a J7772 turn. So there's probably 150 of them up here, right? Like everyone's got one for sale, <laughs> but they couldn't have, they have anything downstairs. And so I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there waiting, trying to figure it out. And you got this BC Hydro guy coming over and he's talking to me. Like, oh yeah, we got CCS, we got, you know, like, chat them all, but we can, you know. So I'm like, well, that's not going to work. So while we're doing that, I don't know where the high end people come over and they plunk down an EBSE, like that level two charge cord, right beside a uh, level two plug. And I look and I go, that's what I need right there. So uh, we talked to the high end people and they're like, oh, sure, you can use it. So I ended up getting, getting a little juice there. Pretty funny. I, finally, I got charged, I'm fully charged. Can you believe that? <laughs>